The Olden World Written by Tsar Yoshi Chapter 533 Nightmare Module 2 Clang! Piece by piece, Meltdown's armor came apart, Gazelle's skilled claws knowing exactly where to work to dismantle it. A radiator hit the deck, and then a fan casing, a tank with hoses attached landing a short distance away. The armor had ceased steaming, whatever magic or technology empowered it long gone. Quickly, the spikes and peripherals were stripped away, and he got to the core, severing the suit down the middle and revealing Meltdown's real body to the world. Wow, Scheinsberg breathed in surprise, standing close enough to watch. She looks even younger than I am. Imperial secrets, Gazelle shrugged, wincing from his wounds, but not stopping his work. Oh well, it's her own fault if this one gets out. It isn't worth keeping. Hello? With a clambering of hooves, Maple appeared in the door again, carrying another healing potion. I brought one of these. Gazelle was instantly at her side, uncorking and sniffing it. Really? He blanched. Hmm. Wall supplies. No one saying wall isn't useful. He took it and drained the bottle in a single go, jagged teeth leaving slight cracks on the rim. Ah, he panted, sitting and holding still for a moment, as the gash across his side knitted itself together with a sparkling of red magic. High quality. You're well connected. So, the lay remarked, strolling closer as he went back to Meltdown. How come you choose now to sober up and be sane? This would have seriously helped an hour ago. Gazelle didn't look at her, focusing instead on Meltdown. Being sober? Is that what I'm doing? He flicked his tail. Ha, huh, I hunt parts for sport. And now that the hunt is over, it's back to the daily grind of cleaning up messes caused by people who don't know what in Lin's name they're doing. You should pick up a hobby, Bats. Blowing off steam is important, with lives as stressful as ours. He lifted Meltdown out of the armor, leaving everything else on the deck, and gently hoisted her over his back, balancing her with his wings. She was an earth pony, slightly small and spindly, with a fluffy charcoal coat that tinged toward orange at the base of the hairs, like heat buried beneath the surface and a cutie mark of two four-pointed stars rotated and overlaid atop each other, surrounded by a flickering flame. There now, Gazelle consoled, they'll give you a cabin and you won't have to be in public eye. Um, sure, Schoenberg hesitated still staring with interest at Meltdown's true form. She looked weak, honestly. The storage effect aside, whatever that armor had done must have been impressive on a level rivaling brain because Meltdown had almost no muscle mass. She was skinny even, reduced to a scared teenager and looking helpless on a level even Maple and Amber hadn't been. Indeed, you do that, Chardo bowed, spreading his wings. Meanwhile, I'll inspect the damage from, um, hitting the iceberg. Scheinspark watched as Gazelle made Meltdown comfortable, arranging her in a bed with a caring tuck and nuzzle to the forehead. Eventually, he got up, silently motioning Scheinspark out of the room and following himself, closing the door with his tail in his wake. Congratulations, he said once they were in the hallway. That's a sight of me very few ponies get to see. Ah, uh, I noticed, Valet remarked, lurking against the wall nearby. You're a weird sphinx, Gazelle. Now, what do you want from us? Weird? Gazelle gave an innocent toothy smile. Please, I prefer complex or multifaceted. And what I want is for us all to play nice and get along while I lie to you about just how far on the back pole I really am. How does that sound? Exciting? Look, if it means no more fights, it's just... Bananas, Valet shook her head. If that's a truce, I accept. There's nothing on that pirate ship I care about anymore. I'm getting out of here. Gazelle's ears perked. Oh, even your missing nightmare module? You got that bag, did you? Valet's ears pressed against her skull, and she looked guiltily to Scheinspark. Scheinspark narrowed her eyes. Gazelle, you know something about nightmare modules? 
A gazelle innocently coughed. What? No, of course I don't. What would a respectable high prince like me be doing knowing about the forbidden relics of an enemy goddess? He reached out and booped her on the nose with a paw. That's not rhetorical. You know something, Valet countered, because I was telling Meldon about this on the frigate, and you chimed in asking which one it was and recognized my description way too fast. So, yeah, you do. What are we leaving out there by bailing on this? Gazelle curled his lower lip into a sad grimace. Oh, Valet, Valet, Valet. Meltdown knew something, too, and she thought it was more worth chasing after poor puddles than that relic. Honestly, I'd like to see it get lost out there. But like I told you, it's the least dangerous of the lot, and it could cause major drama for ponies I don't like. Just imagine Mistvale's reaction. Those flying heathens would know what to do with themselves. Valet cleared her throat. Yo, flying heathen, right here. I'm really tired of your empire dunking on bad ponies. And I'm a sphinx, so I'm legally allowed to kiss you and make it all better. Gazelle's eyes twinkled. But I won't, because I prefer dealing with things I don't like rather than pretending they don't exist. You could work with me, you know. I really did have a good feeling about you from the very beginning. Work? Shyspark raised an eyebrow. Look, just because we're still trying to decide where to go... To what end, Gazelle? Oh, being candid. I like it. Gazelle tail flicked and he perked his ears. Since you're asking politely, what I want is very simple. The Empire can't have emperors, only empresses. That puts my little sister, Princess Gwendolyn, in line for the throne the moment she's old enough. But the Empire hasn't had strong rulership ever since our parents were murdered in Varsadel and the houses are... In a bit of a disgraceful situation. It's not an empire my precious sister deserves to inherit. I want to spruce it up a little, whip this continent into better shape. You've seen Stormhoff's mockery of a court and how they treat Cerusians. You've seen beneath the ground in Isvaldi, at least far enough to discover puddles. And don't think the other provinces don't have buried skeletons too. Surely you can sympathize with my intentions. Verlay nodded. Aha! Uh -huh. So going and hunting down boatloads of bad ponies helps with that. How? I'm surprised you even need to ask, Gazelle beamed. It's threefold. First off, they're criminals. Removing them from the picture outright makes the Empire a better place. Second, I'm hardly going after Sarosians alone. The crew you've shacked up with and taken in on this boat loathes you, you know. Goldberg's the Black's banner for every one of his decades of piracy involved slaying heretics and other silly things. I'm after criminals, not just Sarosians, and certainly not decent people. And finally, it really does make for good sport. He cleared his throat, so long as you observe the limits. Scheinsberg frowned. You don't like Varsetto either, though, she pointed out. It keeps showing up in your behavior, with a potion towards the soldiers, and you said your parents were killed there, so why choose now to attack and try to save those captives in the first place? Gazelle shrugged. Oh, I have my reasons. Let's just say, wouldn't you like to know? He leaned forward, slitted eyes wide and imposing. Of course, he drew back, licked a paw, and ran it over an ear. Not good enough reasons to ignore puddles, apparently, or keep going once Meltdown and I was down. Oh well, now they'll probably all get massacred and die. It would be so tragic if us had all blamed us for it. Wait, Shinesburg drew a breath. You wanted, I wanted, to save them. Pay attention. Gazelle interrupted her with another boop. I just said it would be tragic, didn't I? Especially since the Empire tried to help, and it really was Mistvale at fault. Oh well, it's not like Varsadel has the resources to do anything about it, what with their war and all. Valet lifted a hoof, slowed, paused, and put it back down. But they were only sailing because their airships got confiscated, which you advocated for, didn't you? I don't remember, but you'd know all about how many pirates there are. She blanked. 
bananas. Are you trying to either sabotage Varsadel or provoke them into wasting resources on revenge so they lose their war or something? To get back for your parents? Ha! <laughs> Gazelle chuckled, grinning again. No, but now you're thinking like a sphinx. Good! I don't care about Varsadel, though. I already told you what I'm up to. Now, are we going to get moving? Melt down? Why couldn't you have melted that iceberg before you went down? The essential damage, Gerardo reported, standing and presenting before their ship's full crew, sans Belinda and plus Gazelle, is that we're stuck. Trying to turn the boat isn't working, and attempting to propel us is... Well, we have a large, blocky chunk of ice stuck on the prow, and it's not very aerodynamic. The good news is, for some reason, the ship is undamaged. He scratched his head in confusion. I really can't say how. A collision like this should have done terrible puncture damage to the hull. Speaking of terrible damage, Maple frowned at Jam Jars. Do you realize you just stabbed one of the most powerful ponies in the Empire? This is not going to go well for us. Jam Jars shrugged. Would you rather have gotten arrested? You should be thanking me. And besides, you gave me the sword in the first place. I did. Maple sighed. I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking things through, here or there or any time, really. I need a break. Starlight stepped closer and nuzzled her side. It's okay, Mom. The sound of hoofsteps drifted up from behind them, and Gazelle padded gracefully out onto the deck, trailed by Shinespark and Valet, and looking gracefully content. Now then, he purred, who has a plan for getting us to Stormhoof? First, you're gonna need a plan for getting the ship upright again, Valet muttered, slouching tiredly and not looking to take charge. Mm. Have fun doing that on your own. It hit an iceberg, Gerardo sighed, exasperated, and yes, that's what we're... Damage report? Shinespark raised an eyebrow. How much will it take to get us going? Well, miraculously, the hull seems perfectly intact, but there's still the matter of getting us off of the iceberg. Unless Puddles can help us? His eyes drifted to Puddles, who had fallen asleep or possibly fainted and was laying limply on the deck. Or someone could make the most of this opportunity to tie her up, seeing as incapacitating her is apparently quite a chore. Shinespark nodded, moving for the bridge. Not miraculously. This ship's hull is built to withstand something like that. We put every experimental technology we could into making this the world's best ship, and one of those was a seafaring project Sosa was trying to use to make a next generation of watercraft to compete with airships. It failed, of course, but not for lack of a good hull. Anyway, I'm going to go look at things in here. Maple nodded, watching a gove, and looked back at Puddles and Vanna Gazelle. Hmm, how peaceful. Gazelle stepped toward the fallen mare's body, standing over her and showing teeth. Yes, containing her could be an order. It looks like I'll walk away with this after all. Get me something to bind her that's resistant to strength and can keep the flats of her forehoofs from touching anything. That's the focus for SWOOSH! With a storm of gigantic wings, a huge bulk dropped from the sky, landing in the middle of the deck. Wallace Whitewing knelt, letting Marina and Diego hop off his back and straightened up into a flourish. It took an unfortunately long time, but we are here, the Griffin nobly proclaimed, flashing his huge smile. Hmm, it appears the action is already over. Alas, we were a mite too late. Gazelle's face split in a grin, and he rushed over to give Wallace a fist bump. Wallace, old buddy, just like you to show up to an after-party. Marina instantly zeroed in on Puddles' body, dashing past Gazelle to her side. She's here! Diego, get me the restraints! Hurry! A small area around Puddles was cleared as the traveling heroes instantly got to work, Wallace still standing in the middle. Yo, bathtub? Valet frowned. What are you doing here? Thought you bailed down south or something. Shinesbrook nodded. We came here from Isvaldi specifically because you were gone and wouldn't be able to do anything. How did you know to find us? Indeed we did, little ponies. Wallace laughed, patting Shinespark on the head. 
Fortunately, by the time we arrived at Grand Bell, the teleportation guild had put together a backtrace on our wayward Windigo's rampage, and we had the authority to intercept it. Our little bird also told us that Meltdown was in the area, so we came to provide backup as quickly as we could. He nodded at the Southern Horizon, a well-lit airship drifting to catch up far in the distance. Then he looked down at Meltdown's empty armor. By the look of things, it's been quite a scene tonight. What is most important for us to know? Gazelle cleared his throat, stepping between Wallace and the mares with a grin. Varsidelian still having a skirmish with the Cerusians on that ship. You might want to see if there are any left to save. He frowned. Meltdown is below. A clack came from behind him. We got her, Diego cheered, helping Marina lift the unconscious puddles. She had been strapped to a wooden beam spread perpendicular to her back, both forelegs manacled to it, and chains binding it to her chest and shoulders to prevent her from wriggling free. Be careful with her, Shitepuck warned, giving them a glance. She ate a windigo heart a few hours ago and had been both more powerful than usual and very dizzy and nauseous. You'll probably want to put her upright and not move her around. Evely uh, nodded, frowning at Puddles' body. She made herself sick before, too. Something about eating a whole wedding cake at once. I can't tell if she did it on purpose, but she needs to learn to take care of herself. Marina just sighed, sagged, and hugged Puddles to herself. Diego sighed. Sounds like a thing Puddles would do just to make everyone uncomfortable. I've never really been able to figure out that Wendigo. You two! Wallace appeared behind them and clasped Marina and Diego on the backs with his talons. Come, we have heroism to do! He spun them toward the frigate, then glanced back at Valet, Shinesbuck, and Gazelle. Hold Puddles down for us. We'll be back shortly and can assist you with whatever you need. With another swoosh, they were gone, leaving Puddles bound and everyone blinking as the trio soared off to the damaged frigate. Well, Shrinespeck's shoulder sagged. That's one way to save whatever Varsidelians are left to save. Gazelle blinked down at Puddles. Huh, looks like someone else is laying claim to you after all. We might have to solve this with diplomacy. He brightened, then his grin faded again. I'm growing tired of this. I think I want to rest. You all understand our agreement? He cast around with a sharp gaze. Meltdown and I return to Stormhoof. This Windigo's custody will be worked out between us and Wallace's team. In exchange, Garshiva won't have to know about certain acts of piracy. His eyes zoomed in on Shinespark, one brow lifting. To the extent you don't do anything foolish and draw more attention to yourself. This is a very good deal for you. I'm sure you understand. Shinespark stood straight, returning the eye contact. If you're promising not to prosecute Granada for her mistakes, I'll do whatever you want. Gazelle raised a paw to shake on it, and Valet was suddenly between them, frowning hard. Okay, hold up! Hold up! Hmm? Gazelle narrowed his eyes, taking a step backwards. Is that not good enough for you, Bats? Some stipulation you think she's overlooked? Valet, Shinespark tried to step out from behind her. Valet, I appreciate the concern, but Granada is... Ah! Valet folded her ears and glanced back at Shinespark, surreptitiously tapping her cutie mark with a tail. Nah, I've got a feeling about this. Gazelle quirked his head, waiting. Yo! Valet nodded to Gazelle. Could you move that way just a little? Just, like, indulge me here. How insistent, Gazelle chuckled. I'm actually curious where this goes. Certainly. He stepped aside and Valet tracked him for a moment. Nope, you're good. Coming from where you were standing, not from you. She looked back up, jumping nervously toward the center of the boat. This is spooky. Everyone watch that spot, and someone throw me a weapon. Gazelle furrowed his brow. What are you doing? Figuring out... Valet's eyes widened as the dangerous spot slid across the floor back toward Gazelle and suddenly intensified. Bananas, move! 
She dashed across the deck, throwing herself into him and tackling him out of the way of whatever was about to happen. Gazelle hissed, hitting the deck with a paw to her neck, and Valet immediately shadow stuck a few hoof lengths away. Don't fight me! Look out! Suddenly, the deck where Gazelle had been standing rippled, the shadows across it stretching as if someone was shadow sneaking with no stealth whatsoever. And then, where nothing had been standing, something was there. Starlight felt Maple stiffen at her side. The fur along her own spine stood straight, a feeling she couldn't identify racing for her heart as her eyes fixed themselves on the water-like floor, and then she couldn't look at it any longer. Her eyes refused to. It was like there was a pony-shaped cutout in space standing on the deck that whenever she tried to move her gaze over it, she was already looking at the other side. It registered only in her peripheral vision through its lack of anythingness, a living shadow or lack of light, and she suddenly realized that it could have been there for a long time, and she might not have noticed save for that lingering feeling creeping up her spine. But now it was here, and she thought it evoked something in her, but she couldn't tell what. Starlight, Maple breathed, a hoof going to her shoulders. Stay right here, by me. I don't know what it is. Gazelle knew, though. Do my eyes deceive me? He mock gasped, tail swishing. Well, 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 and here I thought we were all going to leave without ever knowing what happened to this. Valet stared at the thing from beside him. Bananas! Are you saying that's your missing nightmare module? Gazelle purred. Oh, perhaps. Give me that sword. I want to kill it. Prince, the void rasped, wavering. Enemy, Prince, help. Die. Night mother, help. Gazelle pursed his lips, tail lashing. Well, you've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Help you die, you say? He took several steps backward, and then his tail shot out, grappling Gerardo's sword away from jam jars and launching it into the sky, where he caught it with a wing and flashed his teeth. That's the bad pony who stole our things, Starlight whispered to Maple, still unable to banish that feeling. Her eyes narrowed, and her body tensed all on its own for combat, or something worse. She's in there. As if on command, the apparition twisted, and suddenly Starlight could look at it. It suddenly had shape and form, the shadows flowing across its surface like water, and they broke at the head and slivered down its body and spilled out along the ground, retracting and coalescing into a proper shadow cast by the light of the stars. It was a mare, her face familiar as the one who had stolen Starlight's saddlebags, but the rest of her body was wrong. Her slitted eyes, whatever color they had once been, were gray. Her neck was there, as were her shoulders and part of her barrel, but right in the middle of her belly she stopped, her coat breaking away in a flaky line, that concealed a cloud of fluid nebulous purple held vaguely in the shape of a pony and getting more vague as it went on. Her forelegs suffered the same, breaking off just below the shoulders, and in the ether, Starlet could see floating the gray outline of a colorless cutie mark. Cold lightning crackled somewhere within the void, looking less like gas and more like a portal to an infinite dimension. Her wings were there, as were Starlight's saddlebags affixed to her back, but she was fully disembodied from the waist down. H help She shivered, trembling, and somehow stood up, leading Starlight to realize she did have hooves. They were just like the rest of her, broken off and connected to the ever, yet somehow able to support her despite not being a physical part of her. It's so cold, so empty! Her terrified gray eyes cast around, looking for someone, anyone, though Valet backed away in fear, and Gazelle was licking his lips. Starlight glanced up at Maple instead. I don't know how to help her, Maple squeaked, trembling and barely audible. Starlight, she's... I don't know what that is. What it is, it's time to put a poor fool out of her misery. Gazelle held out Gerardo's sword and a wing. You've gotten too close to your goddess, my little pony. She can't help you now. You're already receiving too much of a help, and that's why you're like this. Sleep. Shring! 
The black blade flew. When it hit her, unlike every life form before, it encountered resistance, Gazelle knocking her back as he slashed. He slashed again, teeth bared in a frown, leaving no visible wounds, but each time the bad pony shuddered and cried out, weakening and regressing a little. Eventually, she sat there with a hung head, and the final strike landed, and she coughed, glowed, and collapsed, laying there without twitching. Starlit Saddleback slipped from her back, and the glow moved to her forehub, intensifying in a dark white light. There was a final flash, and it was over, a black crystal laying in front of her, inert on the ground. With a rush of wings, Valet was there, grabbing the nightmare module and the saddlebags and throwing it in before Gazelle had time to react. All right, she demanded. That's cool for now. Now lay off. I have my stuff back. Everybody stop for a sec. Gazelle frowned as Valet stood over the unconscious mare. You want to keep that? And her? What are you doing? Giving myself time to not make a hasty decision, Valet replied, then glanced down at the pirate. And I'm kind of curious about her too, so don't, like, uh, get rid of her or anything. Deal? Valet, Maple called from near the stairwell entrance. I hate to say this, but being nice to that mare in the first place is what caused your things to get stolen. It's not an idea without consequences. Seriously? Valet glared at the pirate. Her ethereal state seemed to be congealing, returning to something more like a normal equine form, but her cutie mark was still gray, and her legs and rump where they had disappeared were hard and hairless, like everything had melted together. She was breathing. Barely. You know, I hate to say it too, but she's not actually looking like being alive would do her kindness right now. You want to come look at this iron flanks? Maple winced. I can see it from here. Sounds like you don't want to. Here, Van. Valet tossed her the saddlebags. Go put these somewhere safe or something. Starlight caught them, feeling several things rattle around her side. I'll do it, she volunteered. They were her saddlebags, and she needed to get away from that mare and figure out what she was feeling. Maple sighed as Starlight wandered off, stepping closer to Valet Gazelle and the unconscious bat pony. All right, I'll come have a look. The rest of the crew had gone back below decks, leaving only Maple, Valet, Shinespark, and Gazelle standing around the nightmare bat pony's barely moving body. Shinespark knelt over her, feeling her chest and throat and checking other signs of vitals. There's no color anywhere on her body, Maple whispered. It's like she's black and white. She had a colored mane last time, didn't she? Meets me, Valet shrugged. I had other things to focus on. So, what do we do with her? If I purely had my way, Shinesbuck frowned, I'd want to keep her and study her to figure out how that sword's effect on bat ponies works, but she's clearly no longer a normal bat pony. Look at this. She tapped a hardened, shell-like body parts that had reformed where the E for once floated. It's... What is she? This stuff? Valet poked her too. It's Carapace. This looks like what bat ponies turn into when you remove their cutie marks with Moonglass, only she's just half transformed and still has her mark. Sorta. It looks pretty bad. It's gray, Maple whispered. Colorless. But it's not cracked like mine was or the Firefly sisters and... Look at her eyes. She lifted a mare's head, cradling it in her lap. Though she had a pulse and was slowly breathing, her eyes didn't focus, didn't blink, didn't even move. And they were gray and lifeless, twice as far gone as the worst days she had ever felt when she looked in a mirror in Riverfall. Bananas, this is creepy. Valet nodded, running a hoof for the mare's colorless mane. Seriously, uh, seriously not doing any favors for my opinion of the goddess. Not only did she apparently make both bat ponies and nightmare modules, but we're like some kind of machines to run them. The first time I touched the one this mare used, it spoke in my head and told me some kind of irreversible physical changes would be needed to use it too. I guess this is what those changes look like. Good thing you didn't, Shinespa consoled, pulling back from the mare and touching her shoulder to Valet's. You probably wouldn't be happy like this. And how happy am I like this, anyway? Valet pointed to herself. Bananas, I... I want to be a real pony. Ever ask yourself why we're here or something? 
Apparently, I'm here because some goddess thought it would be funny to make a weapon or a machine that looks like a normal pony, and my soul got stuck along for the ride. Not really a fun existential... Uh, she blinked up a gazelle. Oh, right. You're still here. Mind, uh, going down below and getting a room? I hate to be a bother, but I kinda need some mare talk right now. Gazelle shrugged, still holding Gerardo's sword. Certainly, but have you decided what you're going to do with her? Everyone winced. You're very astute, Gazelle complimented. I won't pretend to know where you learned all that, but a lot of what you said is correct. The transformation the Nightmare Modules offer is permanent. This sword is actually the closest I've ever seen to reverting it. He curiously inspected the blade, but, oh well, she's almost dead, and even if there's still anything in there to nurse back to health, you know, pirates. Ask Wallace if you don't, or ask that old Captain Golvez. He'll tell you in no uncertain terms how he'll repay you for saving him and clearing his record, and it won't be by becoming a mortal citizen. If you insist on being kind, a mercy killing would be kindest. I'll even do it for you. Maple sighed, then shuddered. I don't even remember her name. Villet raised an eyebrow. Is that really the most important thing to hang on to here, Iron Flanks? No, Maple trilled off. Is there a gentle way you can send her off, please? Gazelle bowed, then pounced with a sword a final time. The bat pony didn't last an instant, exploding into a weak shower of flakes of grayness that drifted, hit the deck, and instantly faded away. Maple's mouth was open from surprise, and one flew in, leaving her blinking and cross-eyed. It tastes... sweet? She realized what had happened a moment later, and scraped at her tongue, but the flake had dissolved like all the others. Valet sighed and hung her head. All right, Prince Dude, that's the end of that. Could you just give us a sword and then go take a snooze? As you wish, Gazelle bowed, depositing the sword on the deck and retreating to the stairwell. Maple scooped up the sword but didn't pocket it, hanging onto the handle and keeping the blade a safe distance away. What? She looked up from the sword to Valet and Shinesburg. Was that because she had been transformed, or...? It does that to bat ponies, Shinesburg sighed, forelegs starting to tremble. We found that out the hard way. I might have to rethink about how I feel about having blood on my hooves after all that. I'm probably going to go into shock. Hopefully we get off this iceberg and on our way soon, but I'm afraid we'll have to wait for Wallace to do that. I'm spent at least. Yeah, to bat ponies, Valet closed her eyes, because apparently we just work differently. You know what else only affects bad ponies? Moonglass and nightmare modules. Bananas, I don't even want to try hooking myself up to that harmony extractor since it works differently between ponies that are normal. I wish... I wish... You wish what? Maple set the sword down and wrapped her four hooves around Valet, pulling her into a hut. How can we help you? You can't, Valet sniffed. I wish I could at least get my existential issues limited to one side of things. My soul is some sort of extraterrestrial parasite from a piece of moon glass, and my body is a machine made to be used as a weapon and transformed to look like one. Oh, nice fit, huh? Shinespark blinked. Is this a story I'm supposed to have heard before? You're a what from a piece of moon glass? Roll with it, Sparky, Valley sighed. Bananas, I feel so much more like myself when I'm not in the funk about things, too. You think we could just avoid political trouble and pirates and sticking our noses where they don't belong and everything else for a while? Please? Like, at least a month? The stupid tournament starts in a month and I'm still thinking of maybe knocking some heads and trying to get us that pass to the Plains of Harmony. I know Starlight had a bad experience there, but it's gotta be better than yaks and wars and racists and destroyed cities. It has to! Maple chuckled weakly. <laughs> We've been so bad at that, Valet. But I agree. Maybe we could try to disappear off the map for a while and see how it works out. Well, forget about Chauncey, leave Puddles to Wallace and Gazelle, hope they honor their agreement to leave us alone. Yeah, I've got so much I'd love to do with some peace and rest, uh, Shinespark yawned. 
first hurry to sleep, but then I'm going to have to do a lot of repairs on the ship. She got a little banged up today. Second, I really want to figure out how the Harmony Extractor works with Melia and Serena's magic. I feel like I got taunted by that discovery. <sighs> I'm tired too, Valiant. Stupid all-day flights and combat and waking up in the middle of the night, am I right? You wanna hit the sack? I think I will, Shrinespark bowed, pulling herself away from the hug. We'll have to get Meldon's armor tied down somewhere safe before we start moving again, but Gerardo and Wallace can handle that. I need a rest. I'll see you in the morning, you two. Or in the evening, or however late I sleep. See you too, Shinespark, Maple waved. Together, Maple and Valet watched as she left too, leaving them alone on the deck. Well, Valet sighed. I guess she took hearing about where I'm from better than she could have, even if I didn't tell her the full story. Don't remember if I've told you 100% either. I'll have to finish that sometime. Valet, do you want to share our room again? Maple kept hugging her. You look like you could use the company. Yeah, Valet admitted. That would be nice. They were silent for a moment, staring at the spot where the bat pony had died and not going anywhere. Maple in particular fidgeted, images of the blackened, reconstituted legs running for her mind. Valet? Something still on your mind, Iron Flanks? I feel like there's something extremely important I'm forgetting, Maple sighed, an inexplicable worry in her heart. Something about what Moonglass does to bat ponies. I'm remembering her eyes and... Can you tell me about that again? What happened to your sister? Valet closed her eyes. Yala? Yeah, she got hit by a piece in Navarro's telekinesis. You know, lead scientist dude from Ice Reach who got frozen when his experiment blew up. And I was kind of preoccupied with killing him when it happened, but... Uh, she shuddered. It's not instantaneous. You get time to... to watch them slip away. We try to fight it, but it sticks to them, the Moonglass. First their eyes turned gray, just like hers were. She nodded imperceptibly at the spot where the mare had been. They feel bad inside. Worse, at least if what she was saying was any indication. She was scared, Maple. It was like... Maple? Maple had gone rigid. Valet, she breathed, suddenly knowing exactly what it was this had reminded her of. Oh, yo! Valet prodded her in concern. What's up? Valet, that happened to Starlight. Maple trembled. The first time we saw a piece of empty moon glass, we were in Iron Ridge and White Chocolate was showing us the piece she had used. Starlight touched it and it clung to her. I was able to pry it off and she went back to normal, but it startled both of us. She was scared and I remember that for a moment, her eyes turned gray. Oh, bananas. Fully stiffened too. Bananas, that's like... Her eyes widened at the implications. Starlight is somehow like a bat pony? What? She's a unicorn! Doesn't have the slitted eyes or the wings or fangs or tufty little ears or anything, but... Her voice grew quiet. I mean, she always has reacted differently to magic and stuff, and technically not a lot of it is stuff I've done, so we've got no clue if I react the same. I always thought it was because she was from across the mountains and stuff was just different down there. You think she's, like, part bat pony or something? Or maybe equestrian ponies are actually the same kind of things as bat ponies? Machines for... Her pupils shrank even further. Maple? I just threw her my saddlebags. She knows not to poke around in there, right? Would she have any idea not to touch the nightmare module? Maple's ears folded in return. We've been talking out here for hours! Lily snapped her hooves, quivering. Bananas, it asked me permission and I had a chance to say no. That Philly better be smart. Come on, let's get down there. Maple needed no invitation to race along at her heels. Starlight slumped into her and Maple's room, the saddlebag slung over her back. With a sigh, she tossed them on the edge of the bed, then slumped in after them. She had some thinking to do. But thinking was all she ever did, and she really didn't want to. Her horn hurt. She had overused it in the fight against the pirates on their ship, and now she would have to wait however long for it to feel better again. Shinespark and Valet and all her friends were safe, 
but it wasn't an encounter that should have happened in the first place. She and Maple and Valet had been busy, and those stupid pirates had interrupted. It was supposed to have been safe. She hadn't really let her guard down. She had been there and ready to fight, as ready as a filly could be. It was hard, though, because she really wanted to be safe, to trust that her friends and mother could care for themselves without her needing to protect them at all times. It would be so wonderful for them to be able to relax. But this was why they couldn't. This always happened, and it felt like the more they tried to resist, the worse the happenings were. This was her life now, eternally needing to care for her friends to ensure she'd always have them. It wasn't fair. Why couldn't they take care of themselves? No, they could take care of themselves. Valet and Shinespark had done that, coming back safe from the pirate frigate, just like was promised. But it still wasn't enough. She felt the tears beginning to come. Why couldn't the world just leave them alone? Why couldn't someone make a perfect place where everyone just wouldn't have to worry about bad things happening? Where friendships could be forever and no one would be alone and everyone could finally be at peace? Finally? She was lonely then and there. She turned over into bed, but Maple was still on the top deck. She wanted to talk to someone, someone she trusted. If she went out of air, though, she'd probably just run into a ha or jam jars or someone else annoying. She needed someone who could be unbreakable to hold her just for a moment so she could get her hooves back under her and her strength replenished to face the world. Her eyes slid across the saddlebags and an idea floated into her mind. Amber's soundstone was one of the things that had been in there, right? Well, Amber was in Riverfall, and Willow was also in Riverfall, and Willow... Willow... she swallowed. Her biggest and best memories of Willow were all of being held. When she first woke up after nearly freezing, barely conscious for a second, in the rain after she was scared and ran off, right before leaving for Anridge, Willow was safe. She needed to talk to her. Horn making her head spin enough that she didn't want to use it, Starlight leaned forward and stuck a hoof in the saddlebags, fishing around for anything rock-like. She hit something, grabbed it, and that something grabbed back. What? Starlight yanked her hoof back and blinked at it in the dim light, a dark crystal she recognized from the deck stuck to the end of her leg. Her hoof felt heavier suddenly, like she was somehow being drawn toward it from within. What? Get off! She flailed and shook her leg, but the crystal was sticky and didn't let go. <coughs> Starlight strained, and all she was rewarded with was a memory. She was on a carpet, maple pulling on a chunk of moon glass attached to her hoof. Another memory barged in, of her on a platform in a flooded river facing Hemlock, a dark crystal sword she had summoned attached to one of her forelegs. Then she was in the crystal palace, watching the harmonic flame burn, and then... A wave of numbness washed over her, removing the tension and setting her back in a room on the dream. The room seemed somehow brighter, but still in only shades of gray, like it was near total darkness. She looked at the nightmare module stuck to her hoof one more time and tried to shove it away. Checking system requirements, a cool mare's voice said in her head. Requirements met or exceeded. Requesting permission to engage nightmare module and... <laughs> Error. System airlock buffer capacity exceeded. Proceeding to dump the console. The system encountered an unexpected error and crashed. Running diagnostics prior to restarting. Critical system extension and support libraries not found. Warning. This may cause magical instability, improper functioning, and undesired or missing effects. Scanning for alternate installations. External backup found. Restoring critical system components from Nightmare Row 2. Please wait. Notice, not all missing volumes found on backup. Upon restart, some functionality might be limited or unavailable. Continuing to restart in 3, 2, 1. Starlight opened her eyes. The first thing she registered was a pain in her hoof. 
It felt like someone was trying to pry a part of her away with physical force, and she groaned, squirming weakly. This made her aware of a body against her, holding hers. It was warm, impossibly warm, and she was just as cold, a void, empty of heat that needed that warmth more than food or even air. She squirmed again and tried to open her eyes and succeeded. Starlight? a distant voice asked. Starlight! Starlight, are you all right? Your eyes are open! Another voice. They were getting closer, like she was breaking the surface of a deep lake. Yo, is your family back? They're gray, though. Gray. That didn't quite register with Starlight brushing past her senses. She slowly regarded the pony in front of her. There was... Maple. She was warm. She reached out, feeling horribly empty. Maple took her, pulling her into a hug. She felt like there was a significance to this she was somehow missing, but she didn't care because she needed it. Also, this was the pony who had been yanking at her hoof, at the dark crystal stuck to it. This was Starlight's first indication that something was wrong. System restore successfully complete. Warning, usage of horn, cutie mark, and harmonic functions may be limited and or cause system damage. View full error log information. Starlight didn't want to, and the words in her head drifted away on an empty breeze. It had said cutie mark. Did she... She craned her head to look, but no. Her flanks were blank. She felt like she should feel more for that. Notice, interface with backup volume, Nightmare 2, established by automatic system protocols. All possible restorations have been completed using administrator level privileges. Destroy the backup. Destroy it? Starlight frowned, her memories sluggish, like something had just raked through them by force and they were still pulling themselves back together. The crystal was... It was dangerous? It was dangerous. It wasn't good for the warmth. Yes, she thought, as Maple and the other warmth held her. She wanted it gone. Permission required to destroy backup volume Nightmare 02. Notice, this functionality will prematurely exit Nightmare Module Emulation Mode. Proceed with termination? Yes? No. She just said she wanted it, didn't she? Starlight frowned, still not understanding where the words in her head were coming from. She just wanted the warmth to not feel so. Her horn flared with color, an inferno almost as big as she was, and like streaks of moisture dripping across her vision, she realized she knew what color was again. Her entire body burned as the emptiness was squeezed away, compressed into a speck like a deflating balloon and wrapped where it couldn't be felt again. By its own volition, the hoof with the nightmare module lifted and Starlight's leg pulsed and throbbed, veins of midnight blue crackling and arcing down the surface and focusing in on the crystal. For a moment, its blackness wavered, attacked by chroma, and with a final burst, it blew apart into flecks of black, melty sludge that spattered and hissed and steamed away to nothing. Immediately, all the energy flew back to Starlight's horn, hitting her and making her physically lurch. A wave of nausea she hadn't felt since she passed out in the flame district descended, and she moaned, unsure whether she would vomit, pass out, or both. But somehow she did neither, hanging limply with her world spinning and colorful in someone's soft embrace. These were her friends, Maple and Valet, her mother, even. Starlight, Maple whispered in her ear. What happened? You've been out for hours. Are you all right? Ah, her horn is kind of crackling, and I can feel the heat from here. I'm going to go with no? That's a loud, Starlight moaned. Maple, my head hurts. Maple leaned into her vision with a scared, relieved smile. You're talking again, she breathed. And her eyes are back, too, Vili added, remembering to keep her voice down as low as possible. Bananas, that was scary. What, what happened? <laughs> Starlight rolled her face into Maple's fur, blocking out the light from her eyes. Maple stroked a hoof through her mane, 
and it was the best feeling Starlet could imagine right then, attacked by waves of overuse from her horn. You can rest. We love you. We're here for you. Love you, Starlet managed. The effort of saying the words almost made her reconsider whether she needed a toilet, but they were important. Because, she realized, while the world had been gray, she hadn't felt or been aware of that at all. End of chapter 533